So thank you guys for coming out. Uh, thank you to Patrick Ricardo for the invitation uh, for the Watershed Council to kind of partner in on this event. Uh, we're going to talk to you guys about a lot of different things today. Mainly it's going to be focused on natural shoreline restoration and some of the benefits and the concerns that would drive a person to want to restore their shoreline. Um, I want to put in a shameless plug. Uh, before you guys leave, please feel free to come over and take some of our materials from the Watershed Council. Uh, there's a lot of great information over here on natural shorelines, uh, native plants, rain gardens, and then some more information about who we are as an organization and what we do. So if you're interested at all, and also please sign in over here uh, to get our emails if you'd like. We don't send them out too often, I promise, but it'll keep you up to date with everything that's going on in the area. So. Uh, my name is Eric. Uh, by the way, I'm the Watershed Ecologist at the Watershed Council. So our mission is to protect, enhance, and celebrate the Clinton River, its watershed, and Lake St. Clair, which right now everybody's in the Clinton River watershed. Independence <coughs> Township is actually where our headwaters are. I always like to start off all of my presentations asking the question, what is a watershed? It always surprises me uh, how many different kinds of answers I can get. And most of them are correct, honestly. Uh, the, a watershed is an area of land that drains into a central location. So anywhere you are in the world, if you're standing on solid ground, you're within the watershed of something. You could be in the watershed of a river, a stream, a pond, a lake. The other thing about a watershed is it can be scaled up or scaled down, depending on how much land you're looking at. So to make that a little bit easier, right now you're in the Clinton River watershed, which means you're right here southeast michigan right above detroit if we were to scale that up a little bit you'd be in the great lakes basin so essentially it's just determining where the water runs to when it rains so right now all the water that hits the parking lot outside is eventually going to go into one of our local lakes here which will eventually drain into the clinton river and then out to lake st Clair, on down to lake erie so on and so forth until it reaches the ocean itself So this is our watershed. So right now we are roughly right here. So like I said, up by the headwaters, uh, our watershed is about 760 square miles that drains directly into the Clinton River. And then the Watershed Council also serves two separate watersheds, the Lake St. Clair direct drainage down here, as well as the Macomb County portion of the Anchor Bay subwatershed. So just to kind of give you guys a little bit of idea, it's a very large area. Uh, lots of different landscape types, lots of different uh, densities, urbanization, all the way up to agricultural areas. And then this over here that you can see in the left, this is our watershed broken down into what we call sub-watersheds. And that's what this map is showing. So each area of the watershed can be broken down into a smaller tributary. So the main branch of the Clinton River, like I said, starts in Independence, Springfield area, runs down, actually goes 30 feet underneath Pontiac and comes out on the other side, and then runs through Rochester, down through Shelby, Sterling Heights, through uh, Mount Clemens, and out to Lake St. Clair. So within that watershed, not only do we have the main branch, but we also have, this would be Paint Creek, Lake Oregon's right there, Stony Creek, the North Branch, the Red Run, different tributaries that eventually lead into the Clinton. So with 760 square miles, we also have over 1.5 million people that live within our boundaries. That makes us the most densely populated watershed in the state. Uh, that's even over the Rouge that encompasses most of Detroit. And with that comes a lot of things that can affect our water quality in the area, things like stormwater. Uh, when it rains and that water comes down, it hits what we call an impervious surface, which is something that the water can't drain through. And as it runs off the top of that surface, it's gonna pick up any sort of pollutant or sediment or anything along those lines and carry it into our surface water bodies. So once again, I said this once before, uh, our mission is to protect, enhance, and celebrate the Clinton River, its watershed, and Lake St. Clair. And one of the ways that we've been able to do that over the past few years is through the Environmental Protection Agency's Area of Concern Program. Uh, we are known, the Clinton River watershed is known as an area of concern through the EPA. We have been since, I believe, the 80s. And through that program, 
uh, the municipalities, all the communities within the watershed have been able to implement large scale restoration projects in order to take us off of that list. That designation is not something that we want to stay on. So in order to get off that list, we want to address each one of the issues that's affecting our water quality. And I apologize, this is really hard to see, but this is pointing out uh, currently there's 11 projects that are either in progress or just finishing up that, uh, that are fish and wildlife habitat projects. Uh, all 11 of these together came to just over $20 million worth of restoration that's come into the area. Uh, so the water quality and the watershed as a whole has really benefited from this program, um, which is also in part with the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative GRI funding. <clears throat> so looking at the area of concern as on a larger scale, I want to bring this down a little bit and kind of scale us down into looking at shoreline restoration in particular. So I wanted to highlight two different projects. Uh, the first one that you see here on the left is not far from us right now. That's actually in Depot Park in Clarkston. Uh, that was a project that we were able to implement last year um, through a mini grant from the Water Resources Commission. And we were able to plant around 2,400 square feet of the west bank of the mill race with all native plants. Um, they're starting to grow in now. We're actually pretty encouraged with the growth that we're seeing. Uh, but that project, the cool part about that project is that it was almost entirely done by volunteers on the day of planting. Uh, the Watershed Council, we're a nonprofit. We only have six full-time staff to serve our entire watershed. Uh, so with that, we rely on individuals to volunteer and help us out in the field, whether it be data collection or implementing restoration, um, or even attending trainings like this and becoming educated on the issues. Another project that we're excited to get underway this fall, hopefully, um, is in 2018, we received a Department of Natural Resources Aquatic Habitat grant uh, that will allow us to restore 500 feet of the Clinton River proper main branch over at Yates Cider Mill. If you guys, if anybody fishes, I'm sure you've heard of Yates. Um, we're gonna restore that for fish and wildlife habitat as well as providing some additional angler access and restructuring those banks to handle some of the erosion over there, which you'll learn more about as we get into natural shoreline stuff. There's also one other thing I wanna point out with that project is over at Yates, there is a cutoff channel that has formed around the Yates Dam uh, that we're currently looking for funding to try to close. Uh, the reason behind that is the Yates Dam historically was the terminal barrier for sea lamprey. And now that that cutoff has opened up, we can get sea lamprey up into the upper Clinton and it's perfect breeding ground for them. So, so with that, let's get into the lakes uh, and why you guys are here. So you guys are obviously interested in natural shoreline restoration and how to protect your lake, how to protect your lake from sedimentation and stormwater runoff and things like that. Um, so what factors affect the health of a lake? There's a lot of them. These are three very broad categories. So conditions upstream and downstream. So what's coming into your lake and what is your lake doing to that water before it exits? All lakes are interconnected, uh, especially in our watershed. Most of our lakes in Independence, Clarkston, Waterford, those lakes are on the main branch of the Clinton. So the Clinton literally runs through those lakes before it goes down to Pontiac. In addition to that, and the next piece is knowing what healthy lakes, streams, rivers, knowing what they look like. In a natural system, they're gonna look very different compared to something that's been completely developed. And you can have the best of both worlds, depending on what you're looking for. And then knowing the common problems and their causes. So just a couple parameters I'm gonna to touch on real quick. Uh, temperature, people are usually surprised to hear that temperature is one of the largest limiting factors for fish. Uh, temperature increases will eliminate a lot of fish species in that area uh, and same the other way around when temperature drops real low it can do the same uh, with climatic conditions and things like that we're seeing temperatures rise and trout need water below 68 degrees Fahrenheit here in our watershed we actually have the last remaining cold water trout stream in southeast Michigan and Paint Creek uh, so we are very interested in keeping temperatures low as much as possible Dissolved oxygen is another one. 
Uh, colder water can hold more dissolved oxygen, which provides uh, better metabolism and better habitat for fish. It allows them to process their food. Um, so keeping the dissolved oxygen high, water cold, kind of works hand in hand. And that's, both of those things can be affected by implementing a natural shoreline design. Nitrate and phosphorus, these are both go hand in hand with like storm water runoff, if you can think about that. So applying too much fertilizer or applying incorrect fertilizer that has a lot of nitrogen or phosphorus in it, uh, both of those can cause very rapid growth in an aquatic system, both of algae and of aquatic plants. Uh, and that is a negative limiting factor for a lot of fish, as well as macroinvertebrates, which are the bugs that live in the bottom of the lake. And once again, both of those can be adjusted by using native plants and natural shoreline design to help mitigate some of those issues. So one thing that we've seen is in a lot of our inland lakes throughout the state, this is not just our area, but throughout the state is we've seen a lot of vegetation removal, taking that out, whether it be to establish beaches or to put in a, uh, a wall, a shore wall, um, or even just development in general for boat launches and things like that. And there's a lot of consequences to removing that vegetation. That vegetation plays a crucial role in our ecosystems and how nutrients are transferred between the land and water and vice versa. So a couple things that you guys can do uh, to help that is pretty easy. Uh, you can become a member through us if you're interested. Our brochures are over here. You can consider a natural shoreline, and I'm going to let Patrick kind of dig into that a lot deeper than I'm going to tonight. But uh, there's a lot of different designs that you can have the best of both worlds. You can maintain that recreational access, and you can also provide for the water quality in a natural shoreline design. We have a River Safe Lake Safe program that will really teach you a lot of techniques that you can use on your property to help control stormwater and make sure that you're not putting um, any sort of pollutant into our surface waters. All of these are free programs. You can volunteer for Adopt a Stream, which is our citizen science water quality monitoring program. That's all free. And then um, on your lake, I hope that you are participating in the CLMP, Crop River Lakes Monitoring Program through the state. Uh, I can definitely connect you to the representatives for that program if you're interested uh, in becoming involved. So I wanted to dig a little bit into a pilot project that we have going right now. Um, since 2017, myself and the watershed ecologist before me have been working with uh, a group of residents from the Deer Lake Homeowners Association to do some data collection on an inlet and outlet monitoring program. So I'd said before that you wanna know what's going on upstream that's gonna affect your lake. You also wanna know what you're, what's happening in your lake and what you're producing downstream. So we've been working with this group of residents to do some water quality monitoring, more on the water chemistry side, to find out what kind of water quality is coming in, what's happening and what's coming out. So you can see up here, uh, hopefully, our results from summer and fall 2017, summer and fall 2018, uh, and I'm, I've actually just got done collecting the summer 2019 data. So our goal is to establish a data set and give us a trend line. So if something were to spike out of whack, we could identify that and then go in and try to find where the issue is. Uh, most of these numbers are right in line with what we would expect. Um, these, this down here is the measure of turbidity, which essentially is relating to how much sediment is in the water column. Uh, the turbidity is actually very, very low, which is a great thing, both at the inlet and the outlet. Uh, list of the parameters that we're looking for. In partnership with the water chemistry that we've done at the inlet and the outlet, we also have our Adopt-A-Stream program. Uh, this is that citizen science water quality monitoring program I was referring to earlier. So the Deer Lake residents have actually taken on a site at their lake, uh, at the inlet. We call it UC6 or Upper Clinton 6. Uh, it's monitored twice yearly, once in May and once in October. And it's monitored for macroinvertebrates, which are the bugs that live in the bottom of the stream. And macroinvertebrates can be divided into three classes. There's pollutant tolerant, somewhat tolerant, and intolerant. 
So depending on what you find and at what uh, composition you find them or what density, you can get a pretty good idea of what the water quality is in that particular stretch. And by doing this twice a year, this program's been active for over 10 years, we've got a lot of data and a lot of trends from all over our watershed. And these are some of the common ones that we've found at UC6. Uh, Trichoptera, or the caddis flies, they have a low to medium pollution tolerant, tolerance. Uh, these are case makers right here. Mayflies, Ephemeroptera, I think I said that right. Uh, pollutant tolerance is very low, that's these guys. And then we've actually found a couple stoneflies here and there, which are extremely, extremely intolerant to pollution. Any sort of disturbance, you won't find them. So we've gotten good results from this program, but the question becomes, how does that data scale up to a watershed wide view? So this graph here was our graph from last year's data uh, showing spring and fall scores for all of our adopt -a stream sites, which we have over 50 sites throughout the watershed. Once we gather the macro data, we can plug that into an index and it'll give us a water quality score. So that's what you're seeing here, are all those different scores. And you can see we have some low and we have some very, very high. So creating that difference, we can start to ID if there's an issue somewhere, if there's something that we need to pay attention to. If a site drops dramatically, we can go out and try and figure out why. And that data is also used by the municipalities, the state. Um, it's available to anyone through the MyCorps website, which I have a link to. So one thing that I wanted to kind of touch upon is our adopt -a stream program focuses mainly on streams and rivers and lakes, inlets and outlets. So what is the next step to that program? So what we did uh, this past winter is I did a little bit of digging into what's known as the NLA or the National Lake Assessment. It's done by the EPA every five years and it's implemented at the state level. So here in Michigan, it would be implemented by Eagle, formerly known as DEQ. Through that assessment, one of the takeaways from the last assessment that was done is that there is a lack of macroinvertebrate or bug data from our inland lakes and how crucial that data is when trying to determine the quality of fish habitat. Fish like to eat the bugs. If the bugs aren't there, you're not gonna have the fish. Um, so one of the things the Watershed Council, myself, I've been looking into is trying to find a way that we could start a new volunteer-based program searching for these macroinvertebrates in our inland lakes as opposed to the inlet and the outlet. Uh, that program is kind of, it's been slow moving, but it's slowly taking off. We're still looking for funding, uh, being a nonprofit, that's always a limiting factor. Um, but you can see all these red dots are all of the lakes in our watershed. We cover about 50% of Oakland County, which has an enormous amount of lakes. Um, but this will be something to look forward to in the future. And if you're interested in becoming involved in something like this, please take my card, write your email down. I'd be happy to give you updates as we go. So with that, here's some additional resources for you guys. Um, our website is right up here. We are undergoing a new website rebuild. So I apologize if it's hard to navigate. It won't be forever, I promise. Uh, the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership is a great resource for you guys. Uh, as you dig into the idea of doing a natural shoreline and restoring that area, there's a lot of great information on that site. Uh, a lot of different partners went into that one. The Oakland County SISMA is the Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. If you have questions regarding things like Phragmites or Flowering Rush, uh, European Frogbit, Red Swap Crayfish, stuff like that. You can definitely get a hold of me, but you can also get a hold of Erica over at the SISMA. I'd be happy to pass that information on to you. And then finally, my core, the Michigan Clean Water Course. Like I said, all of that data that we've collected over the years is available to the public. Uh, you can always just search mycores.net and go to, to the data exchange, search the river that you're interested in, and all that data will pop up. So thank you guys for the opportunity. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'd be happy to stick around and answer any questions if you need. Um, what we're gonna do right now is I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick from Cardno to talk to you guys a little bit more about some of the things Cardno can provide for you and some more in-depth information on natural shorelines as a whole.
Hi, um, I'm Patrick Duffy, I'm with Cardinal. So we wanted to get into a little more detail about um, managing your shoreline and the various things that go into that. First, I wanted to um, describe for you who Cardinal is, what we do. We're actually a relatively large company, more than 100 offices in North America providing environmental engineering, geotechnical and infrastructure work. So we were involved in a project in Indianapolis, actually. They were doing a, some kind of a pipeline operation that necessitated archaeological study on several urban sites, and we helped them develop the methodology for that. Uh, my branch of Cardno provides full scope uh, ecological restoration services, um, from consulting and assessment, design, implementation, and follow-up. So on the consulting side, two of the Two of the more pertinent services that we provide include wetland delineations and permitting. So I was working with someone last year who, uh, he was a, a developer. He bought a house, he wanted to flip it. He needed to tie into a storm drain. He got a permit with water and sewer. He tied it into the storm drain and then found out later that he had not gotten the appropriate permits. He called us right away. We did the appropriate delineation and restoration work and his work was still delayed about six months. So we find that people are benefited from contacting us up front and having us consult for them um, whenever you're doing something that may impact a wetland area. And we do that in, uh, there's other forms of that type of work on varying scales. So mitigation banking is interesting in that it, it's basically looking at a potential development. And the acronym there is the Great Miami Mitigation Bank, which is one that we did in Ohio. They're looking at doing a 350 acre metro park. So they have to look at where might we put that park and how much wetland damage would be incurred by doing that park. And they have to plan for offsetting that damage by creating or rehabilitating wetland air area elsewhere. So we helped design that for them and, and did a geographically explicit database and management plan for them and that. A natural resource damage assessment, which is an NRDA there, is, is kind of a different flavor of that involving maybe you're doing an oil drilling operation and you're involved with NOAA and having to assess what potential damage is incurred and how that might be mitigated. Uh, we also do a variety of species assessments. So Eric mentioned using an EPT index, Ephemeroptera, Trichoptera, Plecoptera, um, stream macroinvertebrate um, measurements of water quality. We do that, plant surveys, bird surveys, reptile surveys, fish surveys for a variety of management planning needs. And then of course we also do the actual implementation of restoration efforts always in conjunction with our native plant nurseries. So we provide custom seed and plant mixes to fit the site, to fit the budget, to fit client expectations. So we offer many services. Some of them include invasive species management, um, native landscaping and stormwater management, so implementation of a, a rain garden or a bioswale, a detention basin, a retention basin, the design, construction, and maintenance of those. And then shoreline management, shoreline erosion control, um, and rehabilitation is another service that we provide. So having said all that, one of the main issues that you deal with as a riparian property owner is uh, invasive species. So I thought the best way to get into that is to define what makes an invasive species invasive in the first place. And my favorite way of describing that is by using the enemy release hypothesis, which basically says, says that you have, say, garlic mustard, for example, from Europe, and someone brings it here and plants it in their garden so that they can have it for their salads. But in doing so, now it lacks some of its native pathogens, viral, bacterial, or, fun or fungal, uh, maybe some of its predators, uh, macroinvertebrates or vertebrates. So deer, for example, around here love to eat oak and beech and do not prefer to eat garlic mustard. So you have a situation in which that invasive species is not being fed upon and over time it's uh, in other invasive species they tend to leaf out earlier, they tend to senesce or drop their leaves later, they tend to reproduce very effectively. So they form a monoculture and a monoculture effectively reduces structural uh, heterogeneity in the landscape. There's Basically, it homogenizes the landscape in such a way that where there otherwise would be all kinds of spaces for varying species to equally compete for food and shelter. Now there is one type of landscape. In the case of Phragmites, now you have a lot more red-winged blackbirds. 
for example. So it has a distinct <coughs> negative impact on biodiversity over time. It can also have an economic impact. So Phragmites is, again, another good example of that because it can grow so tall that it, uh, it obstructs your view sheds and has a direct negative impact on your property value. Having said that, I wanted to just touch on a couple of the common invasive species you'll be dealing with, which are listed here. I'm going to go through each one of them in a little bit of detail. So Phragmites is Phragmites australis, or common reed, introduced from Europe in the 1800s, likely through ballast water. And you'll find a lot of these were actually introduced sometime in the 1800s. Can grow very tall, but to add to what I've already said, it also increases fire risk on your property. So it's highly flammable. Flame lengths can be twice the height of the plant. Uh, fire from Phragmites can spread very quickly. So it can be of concern. Also, when managing stormwater, uh, stormwater management devices like detention and retention basins, they tend to grow very well in those areas. And they put on a lot of biomass, which dies. And over time, year after year, that partially decomposed fibric material uh, clogs your drains. And they end up having to be dredged out, which is very expensive. Um, so really, the rule of thumb with managing invasives um, in that scenario and in other scenarios is to get on it as soon as you identify that you have a problem because it only gets more expensive to deal with um, the longer that you wait. Speaking on managing, anytime we talk about managing a pest species, we talk about integrated pest management, which means to use all of the tools that we have available to us to manage that species. Chemical treatments work. Using herbicide will work on Phragmites as an example, but there are problems with just using that one treatment. You can potentially develop pesticide resistance as a result. You have to stick under EPA label rates when you're applying herbicide. You don't want to put too much chemical on the landscape. Uh, so we combine also mechanical treatments, which includes mowing. Um, I've talked to a lot of landowners, recently in particular, who have tried their own version of, of using mechanical treatments and chemical treatments. So I talked to someone today. Um, she mixed dish soap and salt and applied it to her cattail. And it, the, the plant that she applied it to looked very unhealthy. But the reason for that is likely because she applied effectively a salt on the leaf surface, which switched the osmotic potential. And it was just the plant was drying up. Water was being pulled out of the plant. But over time, over a large scale, it isn't really an effective solution. And you don't want to apply a bunch of soap into a wetland area, a bunch of antimicrobial product into a wetland area, particularly not without a permit. Um, the mechanical treatments, I've spoken to a lot of landowners who have tried cutting Phragmites themselves. And most of them experience something like cutting their lawns, where you keep cutting it and it keeps coming back. And sometimes it comes back thicker and more widespread than it was before. And the reason for that is because of its hormonal control. It has a hormone in its crown, auxin, that can regulate the activity of hormones in its roots, cytokinins and gibberellins. So when you cut it, you're telling the plant to sprout, to spread further out from where it currently is. And it becomes a more um, costly problem down the road. So what we like to do that's very effective is combine a chemical treatment with then a follow-up mowing treatment and do that year after year and keep um, monitoring the population. And as that declines, we include cultural control, which does include prescribed burning, but it includes choosing the right plant species for the site and cultivating the site in such a way that it facilitates the growth of native plants and does not facilitate the growth of invasives. So the more Phragmites grows in an in area, it can alter the substrate in such a way to facilitate its own growth, which is called a feedback loop. And that's something that we um, want to avoid. I've listed biological control here, too, and that's an interesting topic. Um, to do biological control, essentially, we talked about the enemy release hypothesis. So you'd take a biological agent, a beetle, for example, uh, a gall midge that would feed on Phragmites, and you study it and release it, and you hope that it feeds only on Phragmites. So what you want to avoid is releasing a biological agent that feeds on a lot of things and decimates native populations. So it takes years of study 
before a biological agent can be effectively used. I listed two here because there happen to be some natives and some incidental non-natives that do feed on Phragmites, but they don't lower the population in any um, notable way. Uh, the next one's Japanese knotweed or Fallopia japonica, again introduced in the 1800s. It was sold in nurseries and is not anymore. Um, can also get quite tall. So they're, they're similar in the way they behave on the landscape and the way they're managed in some ways. Not as high a fire risk with this species, and it's also not quite as widespread as Phragmites, but it is allelopathic, which means that it releases a chemical from its roots that inhibits the growth of other plants, which is called chemical competition. When we talk about managing this plant, um, we use similar methodologies. We found though, and I've done some research on this, and there are several reputable sources that vary slightly in the recommendations, but we found glyphosate, for example, to not be the most effective means of controlling this. We use imidacloprid. So, it can be tricky when trying to treat an invasive species to choose your own herbicide, to choose the time of year that you're doing it, uh, to try and do the work yourself. And most of the individuals who I talk to who attempt this aren't necessarily having a lot of success in doing so. The third one is glossy buckthorn. Um, Slightly different in that it's a woody shrub. It has high seed viability, so it tends to spread more via its seed, bird spreading its seed versus Phragmites. It spreads quite well through its roots. And I would argue it's easier to manage in that you can cut it later in the year, pile it, and apply smaller amount of concentrated chemical that affords you a greater degree of control over the, the use of the herbicide there. I was peripherally associated with a study that I thought was interesting, looking at a fen complex and the presence of glossy buckthorn. And they actually showed that where there's glossy buckthorn, it tends to take up enough water to lower the water table measurably, which means it's creating slightly drier soil conditions around the plant, which facilitates its own growth, which creates more dry soil conditions. So that's another example of a, like a feedback loop. Question for you? Yes. Uh, I, I've uh, pretty much handled the fragments on my own with a chemical and things of that nature. Is the same thing, would the same thing work on, on uh, buckthorn, which I've noticed is on my property as well? Tends to be that triclopyr works very well, and triclopyr is, a, is specific to broadleaf plants, whereas glyphosate is, is the more common thing that people use, but it's non selective. So it'll kill quite a, a a larger number of species. So brush Good. Brush. I'm sorry? So brush be done, right? You know, I couldn't tell you the, the name of the ready to use formulations because that's not the, the types that we use. I'd have to I'd have to look into it. <laughs> Another one is purple loose strife. Um, introduced as an ornamental uh, Sources say it can grow taller than I've observed it to be, but it, it states that it can grow up to 10 feet tall. Oh, you're not seeing that though, right? No. Okay. I see one. You have? Yeah. Really? That's, that's what the research suggests. We don't tend to find them quite as tall. Higher seed viability. The, I think what's interesting about purple oostrife, one of the interesting things about it is you can actually hand pull if you don't mind getting into the wetland area. Um, but in this case, they actually did find biological control agents that were effective that were released in 1992. So a couple of leaf-eating beetles and a, a root-boring weevil. And the, the intention for that, obviously, is not to get rid of purple strife altogether. It's to reduce it to a population level that's similar to its native analog. It's similar to the native plant community so that they're sort of coexisting. Because getting rid of a, an invasive plant, extirpating it, isn't feasible is uh, almost impossible. So that isn't generally our, our goal in management. And it worked. I've been on Deer Lake for years. I had the most beautiful stand of purple loose <laughs> Before I knew it was so bad. The beetle came along, gone. Fantastic. But 
they're shooting up a few every once in a while around the lake now. I thought it was because the beetle had run out of food that it liked. What it liked to eat, and that's why we don't have the beetles anymore. Hmm. The beetles are coming back, though. Are they? Yep. You don't know that? Okay. I was just curious. <laughs> what I do now is I, you know, I saw one last summer. Oh, yeah. I it and I dab it. That's good. That's it. There tends to be a predator prey cycle, so they, they go in waves. Um, yeah. But all I thought of the it was beautiful at one time. I really yeah. did. All right. Well, that's the hope for many of these invasive plant species that we deal with is that we can develop biological controls that can be cost effective and manage them similar to uh, this example with purple loose So dealing with invasive species is just one of the issues you deal with managing shoreline property. I think that's going on automatic. So we want to talk about a few other issues that are involved in shoreline management. Um, and Eric actually touched on this a little bit, but common issues that I want to talk about, invasive species, aquatic ecosystem degradation, and erosion. And that's just a picture of eutrophication here, where you have um, excess fertilizers or sewage leaking into your your lake and forming algal blooms that leads to anoxic zones that can kill off fish and other animals living in the water. Um, the leading causes for this, poor stormwater management, reduction of native vegetation and fertilizing of your lawns. Also seawall construction is a problem that I wanted to touch on as well. So in terms of stormwater management, and Eric again touched on this, but Water, rainwater is going to hit the surface, it's going to evaporate, be taken up by plants, um, infiltrate into the soil surface or run off. If it runs off, it's going to carry the salts and pollutants or fertilizers from your landscape. If it runs from an impervious surface onto your lawn, which is turf grass is short rooted, it's not going to infiltrate a lot of that water and a lot of that is going to run right off into your wetland area, which also can increase erosion there. So proper stormwater management is important. Um, it can mean planning for infrastructure uh, as far away from that wetland area as possible. It can mean also, and this is more of a cost effective means, is planning a riparian buffer of native vegetation and considering bioengineered controls to manage that stormwater. Um, another point I guess I wanted to add here is when you have that turf grass right up to your, your shoreline, you have short-rooted um, turf grass that's not holding soil in place. You also invite waterfowl like Canada geese. They like that environment very much, yeah. which also lowers your property value. And actually, in terms of stormwater management, you can plan for rain gardens at your, at your water's edge as well. That's something that you can also implement that can add property value. It can be done in such a way that it looks like a, a landscaped parabola, basically. It can be very nice looking. I'll have some examples of shoreline projects that we've done. Um, and Eric actually has a pamphlet over here that shows this graphic. And we like this graphic a lot because it shows you the, the distinct difference between turf grass and its rooting strategy and that of native plants, which tend to have much deeper uh, roots that hold soil and water in place better. On seawalls in particular, so the the issue with seawalls is not that they're not effective in curbing erosion, it's that they're expensive. And when the wave action hits against the seawall itself, it travels downward and it travels outward. When it travels outward, it scours around the edge of the seawall and causes erosion there. When it scours downward, when it heads downward, it scours the substrate at the bottom. And that disturbed soil environment provides, uh, often provides a competitive opportunity for invasives like Eurasian water milfoil. We've also seen seawalls constructed poorly, which does happen on occasion, uh, where um, they were designed to have sand backfill behind the seawall, and instead this person was trying to cut costs, and they did partial sand and partial soil from on site, which was high in clay content. The clay content didn't have the pore space and compression capability that it was meant to have, and so the seawall itself is, is taking more of the erosive forces from that water environment, which makes it more likely to fail over time. Also, if they're not constructed correctly and the scouring at the bottom eventually can lead the toe of the seawall to fail as well. And ecologically speaking, 
this um, wetland upland interface is important for many species in order to complete their life cycles. Turtles need both the wetland and the upland to complete their life cycle. So when you put a wall in the way, they're not able to do that. So it has a distinctly negative ecological impact. I have a question. Yes. Will a riprap wall do a similar thing, or is it? So a seawall is an engineered control. We were going to talk about bioengineered controls, which are kind of somewhere in the middle of just um, plants. Uh, riprap is maybe closer to an engineered control. But we often use riprap. It just depends on the erosive forces at play. So, and that's actually what I was just going to touch on there. Um, when we talk about curbing erosion, we always talk about a, a native riparian buffer because those plant roots hold soil in place. We also talk about other bioengineered controls. And I just wanted to, I wanted to give you an uh, a definition of that because I thought that might be helpful. So bioengineering is an applied science that combines the use of engineering design principles with biological and ecological concepts to construct and assure the survival of living plant communities that will naturally control erosion and flooding. So what's more than implied in that is that we rely on native plants and native communities in order to stabilize these riparian environments in conjunction with other materials. So those other materials can include riprap. Uh, the material that we will choose depends on the erosive forces in part. So if we're we're dealing with a high energy environment, we need to possibly incorporate some riprap in that environment to stabilize the shore. But we're always, always looking at the costs versus the risks. If we have a situation in which native plants alone could do the job, or maybe it's a situation where we're comparing some riprap and native plants and core material, which is a coconut fiber that's designed to be biodegradable over time, um, we consider carefully what the risk is of using this versus that option. What's the ecological impact of using riprap or seawall or just native plants, and native plant roots. And then cultural issues here uh, refers to what do people expect to see. Sometimes on a shoreline people want a clear view shed with very short growing vegetation like turf grass. And we can work with that. We can work within those expectations and with budgetary expectations to put a custom seed mix that's low growing that still does its job at, at holding soil in place. So to that end, what I was hoping to do was show you what some of these bioengineered controls uh, look like. Give you some pictures of some of the projects that we've done so that you get a clear picture of, um, of this. So first being soil lifts. Um, in conjunction with other techniques actually. So here's a high wave energy environment. And so we use riprap at the toe and then brush mattressing. Hmm. There, brush mattressing, which is where we laid down brush on, on the soil surface and, and anchored it down. And then we vegetate it so that over time you can't see that brush at all. It's simply holding soil in place. And then we encapsulated soil in this coconut fiber material to hold that in place and did it in a stepwise function so that water coming upslope down in the wetland environment is slowed and infiltrated and we vegetate this entire slope. And on the next slide I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, this is another example using high tensile strength core log in a stepwise fashion for the same purpose. Over time it should fill in and look something like this. And the, the seed mix here was chosen uh, based on the site. It's a very natural looking site. It's not someone's backyard. It's not necessarily high in flowering, in, in forbs, in color, uh, pretty flowers, showy flowers. It just depends on the expectations of the property owner and the, the forces at play there. Here's a better example of brush mattressing where in this case we used a core log material uh, erosion control blanket material and brush mattressing and you can see how that's anchored down and then it's all vegetated so that over time it's it just looks like plants next to a stream. Ted, what's the scale there? What are we looking at? How wide is that water bed? That water bed is probably four feet wide okay. or less. That's a small scale. Without 
very much weight action. I'm just, you know. That's a low energy energy environment, yeah. um, I have experience with the core logs. Uh, Bob and I did it 12 years ago on our 90 feet of our shore. And um, with all of the weight action, and and we put the grasses in all the native plants. Mm -hmm. But at this point, you can see all the roots of the plants, thank goodness but it is not a very attractive site. Ah. Uh, so I want to, may I ask a question? Yes, of course. Can, because we have a section of only 17 feet to do that it is adjoining to neighbors. Mm-hmm. What do you know about enviro blocks to plant in instead of core, the, the core blocks? I have limited experience okay. with enviro blocks, but I know people that I work with that do. I'd love to get in touch with you after and get yeah, you and some I'm info sorry, on I, that. I went off to my own personal interest. That's That's no problem. Actually, over the last 12 years, we've done, as land managers, a lot more work with this core material and with these bioengineered techniques, and we've learned a, a great deal more. And so the, the likelihood of, of a, a poorly performing project is significantly lower than it was a couple of decades ago when maybe they were first using these materials. Yeah. The reason we even have riprap here may be because there's a risk of flash flooding here and the erosive forces that could be at play don't reflect this current small stream which is what I suspect is the case at at this project site in particular. The next one is a log vein so this is something that can be used um, on a lake situation you might put a log jutting out into the lake if you have a problem with sediment transporting laterally along the lake shore and effectively you put a log or a rock or riprap out into the stream environment or lake environment and anchor it down and it uh, in a stream environment it directs the flow of the water to avoid in this case erosion to this shore this boat launch area here um, in a in a lake environment it can help avoid transport of, of silt downstream or laterally along the shoreline of the lake and this is another material, this is Silt Socks is a brand, but there's, there are a couple of brands that they look like pantyhose. They're basically tubes of, of plastic type fibrous material that you fill with something like a soil media that you then, so they're very heavy and heavy duty. They're not designed to be biodegradable. They can be placed at the toe of a stream or wetland area to stabilize that environment. They differ in that it's, it's more energy intensive, more costly than, than core material and not biodegradable. So not quite as environmentally friendly, but quite useful and um, effective in curbing erosion. And then I wanted to show you some examples of uh, some of the other projects that we've done. So in this case, you have a relatively low energy environment with some riprap where we simply use native plant roots to stabilize the shore there. Um, in this case, this is about a, a 50%, 50% mix of graminoids, so bulrush and grasses and sedges, and 50% mix of flowering plants here. Uh, in this case, the landowner chose something that was much more heavy in flowering plants, and you have this very pretty arrangement of flowers and a, a reasonable shoreline buffer here around this pond. And in this third example, this is just a, it's maybe a cheaper seed mix utilizing riprap and um, a a graminoid heavy mix, so grasses and sedges on this uh, hillside here. The last example I wanted to show, uh, we, after a remediation project, remeandered a stream utilizing heavy strength core log and erosion control blanket. Um, And this is what it looked like during construction. And three years later, this is what it looks like just before we remove the stakes from that area. So you can't see the core log, you can't see the other materials that we put on site. And that's the intention is that it'll fill in and look like a normal native plant community um, that's ecologically beneficial. So I'd love to answer any questions for um, Eric or myself. I have one. What's the, how how steep a side can you do nature restoration on? 
Oh, ratio? Yeah. Well, it depends on the bioengineered material that we're talking about. And I've dealt with situations where it's a 90 degree slope because there's a tree here and its roots are holding some of it back. But if I wait another five years, the tree will have fallen and they would have lost two feet of shoreline. So in that case, you're not applying maybe a, a seeding mix to that because you can't throw seed on, on a 90 degree slope but instead you might utilize something different like a, a log vein. Or you might um, put in a um, core log adjacent to it. And you'd have to see the site in order to decide. Um, so I think it's difficult to answer what slope at which I would do a, a restoration. And just about any, any slope, it's just that you have to take in, into consideration um, what kind of erosive factors are at play, what's the likelihood of of a lot of stormwater coming down and, and what kind of erosive forces are going to be experienced coming down slope. What type of substrate is there? Is it pure sand and likely to move? Or is it heavy in clay? So, okay, thank you. sorry. Can you tell me something about the blanket that you were describing? What is that? What is the composition of that? So erosion control blanket, there's a, a number of different varieties of it, but it's similar to, to the core log. It's partially core, coconut fiber, and it can be uh, a mesh that's biodegradable, or it can be slightly stronger and have a plastic component that is not as biodegradable. You can actually choose varying strengths of this. There's a strong erosion control blanket that's biodegradable, or one that's supposed to last for a very, very long time. Um, you can also use geotextile grids where necessary. Um, and there's, there are different versions of that as well. And that's made of plastic. It's not meant to be biodegradable, but it does its job in, in stabilizing the shore. Do you plant over that? Do you seed over that? I'm just trying to picture how you um, attain in the native grasses and the native plants. Yeah, yeah. So you'd, in the case of erosion control blanket, I would seed and then add the blanket afterward. But there are occasions in which we can go back if we need to reseed an area and seed through that erosion control blanket. Okay, it just it depends on some factors like the substrate. So um, there might be a situation where I need to incorporate the seed, which is better done prior to adding the erosion control blanket down. Oh, I see. So you do the seeding before. Then you put the blanket over? Generally speaking, yeah. I will add to that too. Um, okay. <clears throat> some of the experiences that we've done is you can definitely do it that way with seed. Uh, we've also planted plugs through the yeah. erosion control okay. blanket. Mm -hmm. um, that's another way you can do it. It's Much like we do with the coconut uh, core locks. Yeah, very And that's the intention is to absolutely vegetate that. You can use plugs or uh, live stakes or fascines or bare root trees. We do all of those it, and it just depends on the site and, and what we want to accomplish there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. A good way to look at ecological restoration is a lot of times what you're doing is you're trying to buy time for that vegetation to establish and provide the uh, utility itself. So whatever you do in a high energy area you may have to buy more time using riprap or a log vein or something along those lines or something that's not biodegradable, but in the end, you want the vegetation to take over and do most of the work. Thank you. Um, we have a severe muskrat problem. Yes. Very, very severe. And I mean, it's terrible. My 16-year-old dog the other day was walking our property and I looked over at her and I'm like, what's wrong with her? And her leg went down the hole. Oh. And I want to say it was probably five feet in. And they, and she couldn't get up because it's so deep. It goes all the way down to the water. So I want to say I, I put a, um, I put a pole down and it went about this far down. And they have just dug into our property where you're standing on our grass far away from the lake and you can feel the squishiness coming right. down. So have you, um, what do you do about muskrats and? Right. Know? So we have, uh, I, we have folks in our office that are much more knowledgeable about that than I. But as I recall, if you kill a muskrat and there's an adjacent well-established population, they're pretty good at coming back in. Mm -hmm. So that'd be the first thing that I think of. 
um, if I recall correctly, altering the environment to make it not favorable for muskrats is part of that. I think they don't prefer riprap, for example. What I'd like to do is get your contact yeah. and follow up with you when I have a chance to speak to someone who I usually work with on, on mammal-related issues. So not too like that area is a shoreline? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Save up your we have a huge... Well, that would create a barrier. Yeah. I think it would create other problems, though. Yeah. Good. Yes, sir. Yeah, I live on uh, Susan Lake in Springfield Township. And uh, at our uh, dam, the outlet dam to the lake, um, we've got, we had a bank and uh, about 70 feet. So to, uh, on the bank, we put riprap, essentially cobbles, if you will, to uh, you know, prevent the erosion alongside the dam. And it goes up about seven, eight feet at a distance of about 70. Um, but now we've got this vine growing on top of the cobble, so, uh, you know, some of the riparians uh, say the vine's beautiful, leave it. Um, others say, hey, we spent a lot of money on the cobbles, we like to see the cobbles. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any opinion one way or the other? So we commonly deal with bindweed and oriental bittersweet, and it could be either one of those. Um, the longer that you wait to manage that, the more of it there will be. And you can treat that, but I can't easily mow it on a riprap. Right. So you'd be better off treating that as soon as possible so that it doesn't establish so much biomass that it's a mess even if you kill it. Um, very likely though, even if that is removed, you're going to be dealing with weedy species coming in there occasionally. The cheapest way of managing that is to have uh, someone occasionally do maintenance there, walk through and do a spray and a select mowing mm -hmm. uh, along that area, which uh, does not have to be that expensive. That can be a, a couple of visits every year kind of thing. And there are approved uh, spray chemicals for treatment? Yep, yep. Okay. Every herbicide formulation has a label that contains uh, many, not all, but many of the species that it's intended to treat. So there's a great deal of good information available to licensed um, pesticide applicators for that kind of thing. Great, thank you. Yeah. The Watershed Council maintains a list of landscape providers that are meeting requirements for water quality standards as well. So if you have any questions that way, shoot me an email, I can send you that list. I think our guy who treats the lake is on the list. Perfect. I'll double check. Perfect. Your seed mixture. I've already got a heavily vegetated area, open space. Mm -hmm. Could you actually just throw it over the top of it and would most stuff come up or do I actually have to prepare that soil? Well, the need, uh, seed needs water, nutrients, and sunlight. If you try and seed in the area that's already 100% covered, it's not going to have the sunlight necessary to compete. It might stay in the seed bank for a while and might eventually find a competitive opportunity to grow in. Um, if you have spots, bare spots, you could seed those lightly rake them, add some straw or some other moisture uh, holding material that would still allow the germination of the seed and limit some bird, um, some seed predation too. And just get it to spread. Yeah. About one island and then the um, Depends on the site, but if so, if you've got, it's mostly vegetated already, correct? It's heavily weeded. It, it's weeded. There's a lot of weeds. It's a long, long road bed that I own the property to. Oh, okay. So You'd want to... There's sorry weeds, you know, there's just, there are some flowers that come through, some wildflowers, and by and large, it's mostly weeds. So you'd be benefited from treating those weeds before you spend the money on seed and put the seed down because you'll have a, a much higher chance of success doing it that way. So you can almost rake it, I mean, uh, like uh, prepare it <coughs> in springtime, right? For the, the vegetation there. Well, the problem there is you already have a well-established seed bank of these weeds, yes. and they're going to, if many of them are invasive, they're going to leaf out earlier. Yeah. Okay. So they're going to outcompete any seed that you put down okay. unless yes. you manage them first. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. <coughs> The issue of lawn fertilization is always a, a hot topic. We have people like to fertilize the lawn, and you tell them it's not good for the lake. They don't believe you. 
and they'll point out an area where they produce. A lot of weeds and nobody lives there. Mm -hmm. And other areas where it's not a house, there might be a few weeds. So they look, they look for fruit. What studies you might have? You know, how do we know? What is a safe way to put it? Sure. Part of the issue with that is you might you might be seeing weeds but not be seeing the drain that's leaving silt and other things from the roadway into your water area. There might be other sources of nutrient additions there. Um, your fertilizers transfer into the waterway and then move. It's not going to stay just along your 15, 20 feet of shoreline. Um, so that's not always perfectly visually evident. And it can be okay to fertilize your lawn at the right type of time of year if not done in excess if you have a, a riparian buffer if you have a buffer of native vegetations that have well-established plant roots because they will capture a lot of that stuff and mitigate that issue to uh, a large degree that'd be good if you could publish something like that so you can give the people say here if you want to fertilize your lawn here's what we should you know we have a lot of educational materials yeah. revolving around that should be I, email yeah I was just going to say, I saw something that you guys had specifically. That's the key. <laughs> I thought there were guidelines, even good landscapers or good people that do your lawn, um, if they're good and abide by them, there's so many feet from the waterway that they are not to fertilize. Am I mistaken? Finding a company that's going to abide by those may be a little bit challenging. Um, generally, from the watershed council's point of view, we would say definitely do not fertilize more than three times a year. Um, and make sure that the fertilizer you're using has no phosphate and is slow-release nitrogen. That's the other big piece. Um, slow-release nitrogen, if you think about it, you're not going to put an influx immediately when you put it down. It's going to slowly come out of the soil. The other thing has to do with climatic conditions too. Try not to fertilize if there's rain coming right around the corner. Um, a lot of it, honestly, and a lot of what we do is public education. It's trying to provide materials to individuals who want to talk to their lake associations about these sorts of issues. And we have access to studies and things that I can provide you to try and push out if you like. You know, I, I did talk to the, you don't need golf the golf course management people in Michigan State about this issue. And they said, fertilizer does not move for the most part. If you don't, if you don't apply it right before rain, if you don't apply it on a hard surface, it's going to be taken up by the grass. It will not move more than a couple feet. And if it's been down for a couple of days, this is going to migrate it off. So they poo poo that whole idea. Maybe depending on your vegetation. If you've got really large vegetation, that's going to take a lot of that up. But like Patrick referred to earlier, you know, turf grass, we like to say three inches up, three inches down, that's all you're getting. That's not pulling out a ton of fertilizer. It'll turn neon green after the second application. <laughs> I mean, if you've got native plants do a great job at absorbing stuff, just to your point about the buffer strips. You know, another thing as far as education, your repairings, and which our Lake Association has tried to do because we been in the Cooperative Lakes Monitoring mm -hmm. Program for 20 years now, is the spring overturn phosphorus mm -hmm. and then the fall or late summer. And then the thing is, I don't think people really hear it or really apply it because you can say this is what, and we've been very lucky on Dylan. Our phosphorus is still about the same over this period of time, but mm -hmm. then that's a short period of time in the lake history, isn't it? Right. But it's, it's a hard stuff. Yeah, it can be a hard concept. To, to yeah, change. it is. <clears throat> I've tried to even convince about, use corn food here. But you can't have that golf course green. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I have to use the the use of fertilizer on the this store sure. has less phosphorus than it used to. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And yeah. my mother is mad. She's still <laughs> shopping for that. She wants that 5105. You know, she wants that higher dose. Uh -huh. And I, she'll go by just like the start of her life, which has a little extra in it to keep her happy. But it's like a plot to stop yeah. old people from fertilizing. <laughs> <laughs>
I will say, uh, if you guys go to any of the local ACE hardwares within our watershed boundaries, look for our River Safe Lake Safe logo. It's on uh, fertilizers that have been approved to be slow release nitrogen and little to no phosphate. Is that all ACE hardware? All ACE within the watershed. There's a couple that opted out, but most of them will have it. <laughs> And there are enough of them close by. Yes, <laughs> there are a lot of them. Okay, that's it. Hmm. I forgot about that. I remember that a long time ago. And then yep. I switched to the corn gluten, which is hard to get. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So is there such a thing as a rule of thumb for what it costs to restore shoreline? Is it millions of dollars? It is not millions of dollars <laughs> for residential property owners. Right. There is not a rule of thumb for how much it costs. But there is such a wide variety in um, useful approaches mm -hmm. that we can work within someone's budget. So there's a great deal that we can do within a limited budget. Okay. But if we're in that situation, we'll be very clear about the risks, the costs and risks, right? So it just depends on the situation. We're always happy to come out and take a look. The uh, native planting in Depot Park, what was, the, what was the cost of that project, even with the volunteer? With the total project cost was 5000 For That's 2,400 2, square feet. Yeah, right. Now, granted, that was, that's a little bit of a different situation as we did a lot of the volunteer coordination in house. Right. Um, did you have a consultant on this project? No? No, we did that one ourselves. So, you know, Patrick's right. It can be, depending on what you want to do and what your options are, you can, there's a whole wide range of costs. Uh, most of the work that I've been involved in is on the tributaries in the Clinton itself, um, which are a lot larger, which means they're a lot more as compared to something done on a residential property. Yeah. We're, we're doing a, uh, a new boat ramp on our lake. The, boat, the old boat ramp's about, it's well over 50 years old. Mm -hmm. It's crumbling. So um, we're gonna do a uh, 2,500 square foot uh, native planting rain garden right next to it to capture some of the, uh, as best we can, some of the stormwater come off the Susan Lane. Um, and it's about, uh, with the consultant, uh, $5,000. Now, I don't, we need some volunteers, obviously, to put plugs in the ground sure. later in the fall, but uh, about the same price. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we, you know, we can try to assist you with volunteers, too, depending on where you're located, as long as you're within our boundaries. Oh, we're, we're within your boundaries. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's something. We also, um, on the accountants on staff, we also have a watershed planner on staff that does a lot of green garden, uh, green infrastructure design work as well. So we, that's something we can help out with. Okay. Probably with someone like Patrick. Well, yeah, we, we, have, we got the design already and the plants have been purchased. Awesome. And they're being, uh, you know, seedlings up in uh, uh, the wildlife uh, Guy up in Oakland. Yes, right. Yeah. 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 Wild type? Yeah.